Okay. Raise your hand if you'd like to make a public comment. Okay, P. Huben, go ahead. Hi, hello. My name is Patrick Huben. I'm the president of the Humboldt County Builders Exchange. I'm here on behalf of the board of directors and our members. We represent nearly 300 local construction companies employing over 3,000 hardworking people in our community. It has been brought to our attention that the district will be signing a project labor agreement for the offshore wind project. We understand that the PLA is necessary for the anticipated amount of federal funding needed for the project. The builders exchange requests to be involved in the drafting of the PLA. We feel this is vital to ensure the voices and concerns of all of our members are considered. It is extremely important to us that our local construction worker workforce has an opportunity to be a part of this project. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Chelsea Rios, go ahead. Hello, my name is Chelsea Rios and I'm with McCullough Construction. I wanted to speak a little bit to what Pat just mentioned from the standpoint of a local minority owned contractor. McCullough Construction is a non-union heavy civil construction company based out of Arcata that has been in business for over 35 years. All of our employees are members of our local or surrounding communities. They are the families you see at the grocery store, at our children's functions and supporting our local economy. We pride ourselves on employing capable and talented individuals who truly love their craft and the merit shop philosophy. Most standard PLA agreements prevent non-union companies from participating not because of their skill and qualifications, but based upon their union status. My hope with speaking tonight is the district will consider merit shop and non-union contractors when writing PLA agreements for upcoming projects. I believe that knowledge is power and I, along with other local non-union contractors, would like to share our knowledge with you in hopes that the Board of Commissioners can provide an equitable and inclusive PLA agreement for future projects so that it doesn't exclude local non-union contractors that make up the majority of our local construction companies whose businesses and employees contribute to our local economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else? Uh, this, is, this is Randy Thunberg. Can I say something? Uh, I don't see your hand up uh, I, on the phone. Okay. I called in on the uh, on the on the line there, uh, the one touch line. Could you please restate your name? And Lori, could you? Go uh, this is this is Randy Thunberg. Go ahead, go ahead, Randy. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name, as I said, is Randy Sunberg. Um, I'm president of GR Sunberg Incorporated, and we're uh, we're here in Arcata. We're a local Native American-owned general engineering contractor that employs 40 to 60 full-time and part-time employees. And I want to encourage the board to incorporate language into the PLAs that we see as necessary having to do with construction and maintenance of the up and coming 
wind energy project uh, to use local contractors, whether or not they are union or open shop. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you and sorry, Lori, uh, for the confusion there. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori DeVoist and I represent Pearson Company, a local general, general contractor. For many years, we've been supporters of the community by providing good paying jobs and building local projects such as schools and medical clinics. We've also been very active in local youth sports and charitable organizations through participation and donations. We are supportive of the wind project proposed by the Humboldt Bay Harbor District. However, we think it's critical that the Humboldt Builders Exchange has a seat at the table when negotiating any labor agreements required for the construction of these future facilities. Humboldt Builders Exchange represents us and most of the other contractors and subcontractors in this community and they will help us make sure these local builders will have opportunities to participate in this project, ensuring local jobs and enhancing our economy by keeping more of the construction funds local. Thank you. Thank you very much. You see anyone else, Mindy? No. All right, that'll conclude public comment. And we will move to the consent calendar. I have a motion. I'll make a motion. We set the consent calendar. Second. You have a motion and a second. Would you like to do the roll call? Yes. Commissioner uh, Bowen? Yes. Commissioner Marks? Yes. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. And Vice President Newman? Yes. Hey, could, I, could I just say something on the, the project labor agreement? Just quickly is that uh, so I've been in communication with the Humboldt Builders Exchange. I've also uh, heard from o and Industries, Hooven, uh, Sunberg, um, Danco, and Vegas uh, Construction. Um, I've been in contact with them. I met with the unions today. Ryan and I uh, met with the unions on the project labor agreement. And uh, I discussed with them today is there was a couple of clauses that we wanted to reach out to uh, the, the, the non-union companies and also to some of the Native American tribes, et cetera, to see how we might be able to get uh, participation from those groups. And so uh, then with the unions had said that there's, uh, we, we felt like we could give the, uh, some initial comments to, to the union, but there was a couple of clauses that we felt like we needed to get some additional uh, comments before we, from the, the, the community uh, and non-union and other uh, entities before we could give our response back to the unions uh, at that time. And so we're definitely uh, open to meeting and communicating on those, those issues. Very good. And maybe it'd be appropriate to have an update on the next agenda as to those negotiations. Okay. All right. Communications, reports, and correspondence received. Executive Director's report. Um, it's it's busy. It's really a, a busy time. Um, I was um, participated in the Headwaters Fund where they were talking about the offshore wind and the the how we're going to get the the training and workforce already for the new terminal project. And it's good to see that we have a lot of local contractors and union and non-union contractors. And there's a variety of people that wanna to try to get work on this job. And so we're starting to do a lot of the background work as a county that collectively working together to try to get as much work as we can. And so I wanted to let you know that we had those meetings. And one of the things that we had discussed is that, you know, we prepared a master plan basically from the pulp mill, uh, the former pulp mill to the Eureka, to the Samoa Bridge. And really, and that was funded with the Headwaters Fund. And we've been saying this for a while to the county is that really it would be good if the county could start to do a master plan, you know, from the pulp mill, you know, south on the Samoa Peninsula and really start to look at some of these coastal dependent industrial properties and that some Headwaters Funds uh, would really help with this overall economic development pieces. Um, we also met with the Chamber uh, Business and Industry Committee, which uh, we're uh, participants on. And there's also a number of different discussions with the business community and others that are really starting to prepare for not just the port infrastructure, but how can businesses uh, start to 
uh, participate in the supply chain and other aspects of it, in addition to the work force, uh, the supplying materials, supplying pieces of equipment and other things. And so there's a lot of work that is going to take place in the community to, to, to get a wide variety of benefits. And there's, there's a bunch of groups uh, in addition to the Harbor District that are working together uh, on those topics. Um, I also wanted to to say is that um, you know this this year we had um, three cruise ships uh, that came in, and so the most recent one was the uh, was the scenic uh, eclipse, and so uh, we were able to go up, and so uh, uh, they asked me to present this to the uh, the board, and so I'd like to give this to the, uh, the vice president, if I may, Of course. So uh, Aaron, here's a, a gift from the captain of the uh, scenic eclipse uh, to the to the Harbor District. And, um, you know, with that, I wanted to say is that um, it takes a lot of work to bring in a cruise ship, um, but I can tell you the, the faces on the longshoremen and the tugboat operators and the bar pilots and the maritime community in general that actually got work uh, when they come into play. And um, there, was a, there was an issue with the shuttle and my, I personally uh, shuttled uh, 10, uh, 10 trips back and forth from the cruise ship to Old Town. And so I was able to talk to over 25 of the passengers personally as I was shuttling them, them back and, uh, uh, and forth from the, uh, the, the area. And I, I must say that they were, they were really impressed with the Port of Humboldt and they thought uh, that Old Town Eureka looked absolutely amazing. When they turned the corner and actually went in and saw some of the old buildings, uh, it was it was it was pretty good to hear people uh, talk about Eureka because we see it every day in Humboldt County, but when you see it as like you're just pulling into town in the first sight and the first impressions, uh, it is uh, it was uh, it was good to, good to hear. And so with this 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 group, the the Harbor District with the City of Eureka, the County of Humboldt, uh, really the wide variety of people that kind of worked on this. Um, the county and the city and the harbor district were really a good a good team on putting this together with the the, the cruise ships. And I know if, if Chet Alvin was here, he'd uh, he'd be be saying yes, it, we should continue to do some work on the cruise ship in the industry. And so I wanted to kind of give a report uh, on that. And uh, overall, um, you know, staff is working fast and furious. It's a busy busy time. Um, but uh, it's also really enjoyable to work on the waterfronts. And so again, I really encourage everybody to come down to Humboldt Bay and uh, Sarah Borellis is gonna be here uh, on Humboldt Bay. And I think there's gonna be 15,000 people on the shoreline uh, of Humboldt Bay and it's a, it's a beautiful place. So come on down to uh, have recreational activities on the bay and buy fresh fish from our fishermen. Thank That's you my report. That inspirational report. <laughs> Thank you very much for getting. Uh, Thank you for the gift from the captain. Um, that report. Okay, uh, Chris here from the uh, facilities department. I want to thank the board tonight. You approved a contract for our new maintenance manager, uh, Robert Provel. He's a uh, promotion from within, and uh, someone who's been with the district quite a number of years. Filled. Uh, roles for us in Shelter Cove, as well as Fields Landing Boatyard, and he's been uh, here between Willie Allen and the Marine Terminal over the past uh, two years. So uh, congratulations to Robert. We're excited to have him hit the ground running on Monday. Um, the staff's been busy preparing for the concert Larry mentioned. Uh, we received a mutual aid request from the U.S. Coast Guard and from uh, the Police Department, so we'll start deploying security measures uh, early Saturday morning. Uh, we're going to have a viewing area uh, specific for uh, for boaters and then uh, go ahead and keep the waterways open. Um, I think that's pretty much the extent of it. We've just been busy and uh, so. Um, did I say that? No, we're going to deploy Saturday. Yeah, we're deploying Saturday. I'm not claiming the concert Saturday. It's Sunday. And uh, I believe that's the end of the report. Oh, forgive me. We also have Sunday here in Ilot a Austin Healy Car Club. So that'll be a big event. Um, so we are preparing for a lot of people on the island this weekend. We will have a uh, nearly a full crew on Sunday. And uh, we'll get a little, uh, although in the distance, we'll get a little concert. So that's 
my report. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Rob. Um, so during the last board meeting, the Nordic uh, hearing went before the EIR, or the Nordic EIR went before the, the Board of Supervisors. So that appeal was denied and the EIR was finalized. Um, so that I think is big news. Uh, and the permits are, are going well. We're members of the Special District Association of California, and they asked us to be a host for their uh, legislative tour last week. So we hosted that. Uh, and the California Energy Commission had a, uh, a big public meeting last week uh, about offshore wind and uh, BOEM uh, is continuing to say that their lease auction is going to be the end of this year. So every chance they get, they keep saying the same thing, which is great. So they're not stalling that. Uh, and then uh, the board asked for an update on intertidal and uh, the intertidal pre-permitting uh, EIR or the MND will be coming to you uh, in a future board meeting, uh, probably in November. All right, thank you very much. And our uh, our guest is here. So. Oh, he is. Okay, so we're gonna stick to the. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Committee reports. Uh, not that much to report. Um, been participating in some uh, subcommittee meetings. And uh, I will be leaving early today to go participate on a panel discussion for the Which Way the Wind Festival happening over at Synopsis tonight. Um, and so if you're not here, you can go there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all I have. Thanks. Richard? Commissioner Marks? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have much to report. I'm in the... Um transition phase of uh, moving to Sacramento County. And so um, I'm keeping dual residency right now. And so um, I'll be here for a few more meetings and then my replacement, Greg Benson will be coming on in December. You missed. No, I was the more of this person. Where do you want your surprise party? <laughs> Commissioner Higgins. Well, it's uh, it's an interesting time, and I'm uh, participating in the Humboldt uh, Bay uh, Economic Development Committee. What do, what do we call that? At any rate, uh, the wind uh, deal and with Nordic on the peninsula, uh, it really looks like we have substantial upside. And so I'm, I'm pleased with those prospects. Um, I, in the field, my Eel River Recovery Project deal, I found coho salmon juveniles all over uh, in places that I didn't expect. And it seems like last year they got the perfect water to ride. Steelhead didn't get water to spawn. And so the co coho had no competition. And so all of a sudden coho went from like seldom seen to all over the place. and the water year was just enough. It was like lots of rain a year ago in October, then enough through December, then it shut down for a couple of months and then enough in April. And just as the creek was starting to dry up after the hundred degree temperatures, it got to cold at night and the streams and the headwaters, the eel switch back on because the trees are switching off. So um, take what you can get. And it's a, it's a pretty neat thing to see coho in places that I didn't expect them. And I hope that it inspires people to do more to conserve water, uh, to improve forest health. So there's more water yield from our watersheds uh, to, uh, you know, to really kind of get in harmony with nature and be better stewards because now's the time. Thank you for that. As for my own report, I would like to also speak to the excitement about the cruise ships. I uh, was involved personally running a, the line boat for TMZ Marine Services. And it was just great to see the excitement and hear about all the happy stories of people living in the area and whatnot. I've also been involved a lot with uh, uh, subcommittee work and uh, a lot of big stuff happening. It's very exciting and a little scary, but things seem to be rolling. So we'll keep up the good work. Uh, correspondence received. Um, we had. Um... 
public records request that we uh, completed. Uh, there was actually uh, two of them from the same party. It was dealing with the, um, the Nordic Aqua Farms um, and they wanted to see the reimbursement uh, and all the invoicing that was associated with the, uh, the, the long pin smelt sampling. Uh, and then there was a, another one that wanted to see the, uh, all the documents associated with the permits that were the existing permits and the permitting for the intake system. And so we submitted uh, those uh, this this week, and so that was our the correspondence uh, that we had. And that wraps that up. We we we, we got that. All right. So I guess we move the number ten unfinished business. Yeah, staff would recommend that the board adopt uh, amendment number four to ordinance number five. And so I'm happy to go into any detail on that. But once you ad adopt this, then uh, it'll go into effect 30 days after uh, adoption. And this would basically increase the fees from that or the not the fees. We don't charge you guys this, the, uh, the salary that you receive um, from $400 to 500. I'm sorry, from $400 to $600 uh, per month. For all of the ordinances. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. We need to go to the public before we do. Any, any comments? Like no one? So bring it back to the board. I think that there's been plenty of years where we've only been paying three hundred dollars, and uh, it's time to get it down a little bit. Um, I, I know I'm leaving, so I'm not going to be part of this. But I know that all your work is more than worth it for the pay. So I, I'm more than happy to support this six hundred dollars a month for all of the issues. Hasn't gone up in fifteen years. No, <laughs> well, it appears we're ready to do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Coleman? Yeah. Commissioner Marks? Yes. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. And Vice President um, um, Newman? Yes. All right. On to new business. Humboldt Bay Natural Shoreline Infrastructure Project report only, it looks like. Yes. Uh, so several months ago, the uh, Humboldt Grand Jury uh, submitted a uh, letter to the county, the two cities and the Harbor District, uh, among other things, asking the four entities to work together uh, to plan for sea level rise. Those activities have been well underway for years, um, but we took that as a inspiration to, to continue that partnership. Uh, the county is engaged in a project which I think is uh, the most meaningful sea level rise preparation project that's been uh, enacted in Humboldt Bay. And so we asked uh, Deputy Director of Public Works, Hank Seaman, to be here. And I think he's brought some um, colleagues from a consulting firm to assist him. Um, so we're going to share screen, I think, with him. And uh, he's got a presentation for us. Thanks, Rob, and good evening, commissioners. How's my audio? Really good. Very good. Best yet. <laughs> and can you see my slides? Yes. Yep, looks good. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation to share the results of our study looking at the feasibility of a potential innovative approach to adapt to sea level rise. And I want to acknowledge Jeremy Svela and Brett Vivian with GHD. They did a terrific job as the technical leads for this project. And this is an example of what's called natural shoreline infrastructure. Uh, it's also called living shorelines or even nature-based adaptation strategies. Um, but the basic concept is trying to use natural habitat, natural landforms, natural processes to help provide uh, flood risk reduction benefits. So I'd like to start by just 
talking about the bigger context for this project. Um, in 2005, Humboldt County had a major coastal flooding event. And this is a photo taken from southbound 101 near Indianola between Brainerd and Breakett. And, you know, extreme high tides concurrent with storm surge and strong winds led to uh, water being pushed over the railroad, um, flooding the southbound lane of 101, causing traffic to be closed uh, for a few hours. And then these are some pictures of the aftermath. Um, that event contributed to the ongoing erosion of the rail bed and caused significant damage and represents flood hazards to Highway 101 and the, the landward um, properties. And there's a one mile segment between Brainerd and Breakut that really is probably the most vulnerable segment of shoreline, at least between Eureka and Arcata, due to a combination of um, being the, having the lowest elevations of the rail bed, plus the poor condition of the rail bed, plus the absence of salt marsh, which can provide uh, a buffering role. And then just for more context, um, there's a linkage with the next item on your agenda to reapprove the development permit for the Humboldt Bay Trail South project. And this map shows um, the Bay Trail South project is four and a quarter miles and extends from just north of Breakut into Eureka across Eureka Slough, connecting with the waterfront trail at Target. And it crosses this Brainerd to Breakut segment. We've been working on that project for several years and realized the importance of understanding flood hazards and sea level rise. And so probably four years ago, that led to getting grant funds. And then over two years, we worked with consultants and partners to develop a sea level rise adaptation plan for the larger Eureka Slough hydrographic area. And we really tried to advance our understanding of flood risk and then also start transitioning to think more about projects, adaptation projects. So going from kind of assessment to project planning. Um, so yeah, you can see that it's about a one and a quarter mile segment between Brainerd and Breakett. And then I should also just mention that Caltrans is also developing what they're calling their comprehensive adaptation and implementation plan for sea level rise uh, along Eureka Arcata corridor. That's required by the Coastal Commission and that's due in 2025. So there's a lot of kind of planning to think about this area. And this just shows an example of um, a typical section for the Bay Trail South project near Brainerd and Breakut. And, you know, the Bay Trail was fundamentally for active transportation and coastal access, but we discovered the need to make these urgent improvements to address the flood hazards. And so our project design includes uh, repairing the shoreline armoring between Brainerd and Breakut, and also raising the elevation of the railroad to a minimum elevation and then raising the, you know, creating the trail elevation to a minimum height. And that was based on technical studies that were done as part of that adaptation plan. And in fact, I can illustrate that, you know, this shows the inundation that would happen um, beyond the highway for um, a water level of 10.6 feet. And you can see, you know, water depths of one and a half to two and a half feet. That's under current conditions. And then with the tools that we developed, we were able to simulate the, the flood reduction benefit from the Bay Trail project by raising the railroad to a minimum elevation and repairing the armoring. So the Bay Trail, Pro, the Bay Trail South project will buy some time to be better prepared for, for sea level rise. Um, but one thing it, our project doesn't do is we don't address the continued exposure to wind waves and kind of the energy and the erosive power from wind waves. Wind waves can also be a mechanism for overtopping of the shoreline and bringing water um, inland. And so, you know, looking around the shoreline in Arcata Bay, um, there's a lot of variety and there's several places where salt marsh is abundant. 
and extends out, you know, 50 to several hundred feet out into the bay. And then there's areas where it's absent. And the condition of the railroad and the shoreline is really, it correlates very well with the presence or absence of salt marsh. And so um, this is narrow footage looking south, just north of, north of Brainerd. And you can see there's some remnant salt marsh, but really very little. And then here's a, a zoom in of where there's those remnant salt marsh. And it really drives home this concept that the salt marsh um, provides this benefit by um, attenuating wave energy and reducing the erosive power of the wind waves. So this is kind of the visual proof of concept and led us to um, applying for funds to do a more formal feasibility study to test the concept of trying to restore salt marsh along this segment of shoreline to help um, with flood risk reduction, but also to, to expand that um, rare habitat type. And so we got funding um, and we did a study that just got completed um, in June. The final report um, is actually dated September 2nd. So it took us a little while after the, the end of the grant period. Um, and we had really good assistance from GHD, Northern Hydrology, Connor Shea with Fish and Wildlife Service, and then a, an active technical working group. So this is that study area between Brainerd and Breakett. And one of the things we did is we really wanted to understand just conditions, you know, pre-development conditions to the extent that we could to understand what the conditions were um, originally. And this shows imagery from 1870, which does indicate that prior to uh, the railroad and the highway that salt marsh did extend further out in this area. Um, this also tells us that the shoreline has been um, significantly altered with levees and the railroad. Um, and not only that, but the slough channels have been rerouted. So we need to take that into account when we think about sediment and, um, and just the, and also the longshore currents that could be affected by, um, you know, the development that happened in, in Breca and Brainerd. Um, this also shows that, you know, pre-development that the salt marsh extended really, um, you know, kind of deep into the, the fringe of the bay until it intersected with the uplands. And so um, just the, the result of development has caused a real, a, you know, significant, probably a 90% loss of salt marsh around the bay. So that's an important consideration. When we think about the, the benefits of trying to restore or reestablish salt marsh. So, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about specific objectives and, you know, really these are, I would say, co-equal goals, you know, maybe even first and foremost to try to restore and enhance the salt marsh habitat, and then also to reduce erosion for that transportation corridor. And one of our challenges is that the salt marsh are a very dynamic landform. So they really depend on um, sediment deposition to, to help keep the elevation high enough for the vegetation to uh, be established. Salt, salt marsh has this really sweet spot where you need a relatively low energy conditions um, plus sufficient sediment to help um, the ground surface keep pace with um, changing sea levels. And there's also the effect of subsidence where the, the sediments compact over time. So our basic question was, you know, what would it take to create favorable conditions today to allow salt marsh to um, be established and persist? So we have a nice long report. It's on our website. Um, a lot of good work that was done into this. Um, looked at alternatives, did a lot of just trying to understand the hydraulics and the sediment dynamics in this study area. Um, I'm going to zoom forward and just show you some visual renderings of the project, the concept that was concluded to be um, likely the most favorable design. It's not to say it's the only design, but it's something that we wanted to pursue further. 
So these pictures show kind of a before and after of existing conditions and then what a proposed project could look like. And there's basically three zones. You have kind of a transition zone from the upland down into a new salt marsh. You have this long um, area of salt marsh with tidal channels. And then the leading edge has a berm with um, a beach of coarse sediment. And that's often called a shingle beach. So, you know, just thinking about construction um, in basic steps, you know, the first step would be to build that outer barrier first, and that would help with containment and equipment access. And then the concept that we developed in the report was to do um, active restoration, which would involve bringing in or importing fine material that would be placed to at the right elevation to create the salt marsh. And then um, kind of a strategy for vegetation and vegetation maintenance. So that's the basic concept. And I've got, a, I've got two drawings to show the typical section in two parts. So this shows the railroad on the left um, and the Bay Trail. The railroad be at, would be at an ele elevation of 11 and a half feet. There'd be this transition zone, maybe 40 feet down to the salt marsh. Then the salt marsh would extend out for a little over 100 feet, and it would be, um, you know, subject to a network of tidal channels. And then at the outer edge, there would be this berm, and then um, a sloped um, beach surface with coarse material. So overall, it would extend out about 175 feet from the shoreline. And the concept is that you would build it build the salt marsh to the target elevation, which is about seven feet, um, and then stabilize the leading edge to protect it from, um, from high velocity currents and, and, and wind waves. And then creating that low energy conditions behind the berm would help um, vegetation to get established and to stabilize. And then the study concluded that there would be sufficient sources of sediment to um, allow accretion to keep up, to keep pace with sea level rise um, for at least most of the century. At some point in the future, you know, if sea level rise um, continues to accelerate, there'd be some point in the future where, um, where the salt marsh could get flooded out. But our study concluded that it would likely have benefits for several decades. So this just shows one more visual rendering um, before and after, um, kind of looking northbound or northward from, from Brainerd. And you can see the um, depiction of the, the Bay Trail and there's a bridge that crosses over to the north side of Brainerd. Um, and if, if this full project would, be built in this footprint, it would create approximately 17 acres of salt marsh. Um, and there are examples of these types of projects happening up and down the coast. Um, a lot of creative works being done in San Francisco. And so there's examples to follow and guidance to um, take advantage of. So um, this was a feasibility study really wanted to try to identify a likely feasible design. Um, we had good input from the regulating agencies. Um, Coastal Commission, no, I'm, I'm sorry, the Water Board indicated that they thought this could be permitted as a restoration project. And the Coastal Commission is also trying to actively support um, nature-based adaptation strategies. So there's a lot of positive feedback for the project concept. Um, there's still work that needs to be done. And this would require importing a significant volume of material. And the construction cost is really sensitive in terms of the unit cost for how that material is sourced and handled and conditioned. So really the next step would be to do some further technical analysis, kind of honing in on um, material management and also doing you know, more engineering to fine tune the design. 
And one option would be rather than launching into trying to plan for design and construction of the full project, there would be the option of um, doing a pilot project, doing a portion. Um, GHD's preliminary design had identified nine different cells. And so it would be natural to have a pilot project with one of those cells. And there is an opportunity here to consider beneficial reuse of dredge spoils. Um, and so the county would be very interested in working with Harbor District staff to explore that potential and think through just the constructability and cost issues that um, would apply and how we could try to make it economically feasible. And I think that would be um, a good investment, whether it plays out for this project or, um, you know, one of the one of the possible outcomes is that the determination is made that it's more cost effective to try to do salt marsh creation and beneficial reuse closer to the source. But I think either way, it would be a good investment to try to um, explore a potential nexus with beneficial reuse of dredge spoils and this type of um, salt marsh creation project. So that's an overview of the project, and I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Seaman. Uh, go ahead, Pat. Uh, very informative um, and uh, very hopeful. And it's actually, I think it was like 2011 when I first saw this seed the edge of the bay to restore the salt marsh. And it's a process where every few years you kind of have to go back and, and uh, kind of put more sediment on there. Um, but now I'm going to crack wise, Hank, and say, can you help us get a permit to use a suction bridge so that we can suck up material and relocate it around the, the, the edges of the bay to improve the ecosystem function of the bay? And we've been stymied on that. And if we're stuck with uh, dredging uh, with the clamshell, uh, you can't get it to the edge of the bay. So it's got to be slurry. And we have to get past. Uh, uh, regulatory impasse that seems to work against us uh, and against ultimately against improving uh, Humble Bay ecosystem function. So this is kind of like long-term frustration, but I, I really like the fact that the county's taking a lead. I like your uh, hypotheses and your game plan, and I hope that we can help you bring it to fruition. Perfect. Commissioner Marks? Yeah, of course, you know, we do have more dredging that needs to be done with the island. So on the last dredging cycle that we did have, um, we did have some uh, soil that was reused. And so hopefully we can find a way. I, again, I, I share Commissioner Higgins, you know, worried about um, the regulatory agencies not being really helpful through the process and hopefully that changes and because uh, beneficial reuse of that dredge material would be so, I really think it would help benefit this, this, this program we have to decide to see. I, I'd agree that uh, anything that we can do to uh, reuse dredge tailings from various projects around the day would be very beneficial. I'm also interested in the possibilities of maybe some uh, Field grass mitigation along with the, the project, if there's any possibility of that. Um, Our project area doesn't include any eelgrass habitat. Yeah, it's not too high. And I think the elevations are too high. So, just for uh, anybody that's listening, um, the dredge stuff from Woodley Island Marina and Eureka side, it's, it's clean stuff. So it's not it's not a problem for redistributing like the spoiled materials. Uh, this is the new time. This is these are not dredge spoils. This is reusable sediment, and uh, it'll help ecosystem function of the bay. And it's great that it's tied in with uh, with the recreational amenities, which are also part of the district's charge. Hey? Yeah. And we we really appreciate all the efforts of Humble County and uh, and your department advancing the Bay Trail. It's gonna be a local treasure. 
Certainly. Uh, is there anyone from the public that wants to comment? Don't see any hands. Well, thanks. Thanks again for that, uh, Mr. Seaman. That was an excellent report and uh, very hopeful about the trail. Yeah, let Thank us you. All right, I guess we can move on. Consider adopting resolution 2022-12, establishing findings relative to approving Harbor District Permit 2022-04, conditions for the Humboldt Bay Trail South. So moved. I made the mistake of cutting off Ron Coleman last time before his report. I'm going to give him a chance to do that. Okay. Do you want to report? Yeah, we can do that after we get a second. Go ahead, go ahead, Rob. Um, I will right. draw my vote. I'll give you a summary, uh, and then you can decide if you want a more detailed report. There was a full stop report submitted to you in the agenda yeah. packet. Yeah. So this is for a multi-use trail, uh, and you know it serves both transportation and recreation purposes. So as a recreation district, this definitely falls within our purposes uh, to support these kinds of projects. The CEQA for this is uh, complete. Um, the Harbor District was a responsible agency and the Harbor District concurred with the CEQA determinations, which uh, the county was a lead agency through a resolution of uh, 2020-104. And um, all the details provided in the staff report. Uh, so I have more information if you want it, but staff recommends adopting the resolution uh, and uh, approving the permit. All right. So move. We have a motion and a second. Anyone from the public would you like to make a comment? Not seeing any hands up. Oh, we have a hand. Go ahead, Hank. Yeah, I just um I want to thank Richard for being a long time, well, both Richard and Pat for being longtime supporters of the Bay Trail. And Richard, I, I really hope you can come back um, and recreate on the trail after you move to Sacramento. Um, and just today, the California Transportation Commission allocated our um, award of $13 million for the Bay Trail. Great news. That's a big milestone. And then with the Harbor District permit tonight, that will be the last regulatory permit. Um, so we're currently finalizing the design plans, uh, working with Caltrans on um, some elements that, you know, that have an intersection with the state highway. Um, we're really aiming to try to put the project to bid in January. And this is a big project. This is probably an order of magnitude bigger than a typical public works project, but um, we've gotten a lot of support and the, the starting line is in sight. So if we could start construction late spring, try to do as much construction as we can next season before October, and then um, we may need to you know, continue through the winter. Hopefully we can do all the grading um, and earthwork during the dry season, but, um, but we're getting much closer and getting that allocation today and then with your permit tonight, um, today's a big day for the Bay Trail. Thank you. Oh, Hank, go. Thank you. Great work. Uh, bringing it back to the board. Any more comments? All good news. All good news. Pretty important to me as well. I was on the 1718 grand jury and was involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we get a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Higgins. Yes. Commissioner Marks. Yes. And Vice uh, President Newman. Yes. All right, moving on to C, consider adopting resolution 2022-13, establishing findings relative to and approving Harbor District Permit 2022-05 with conditions for the City of Eureka Samoa boat launch improvements. All yours. All right, uh, so this is uh, the Existing 
uh, boat launch uh, under the Samoa Bridge and Waterfront Drive. Uh, the project is the addition of a new floating dock and piles uh, to expand that. Um, no eelgrass will be directly impacted by the footprint of the project and measures in place to avoid direct and, and indirect impacts to eelgrass. CEQA has been complete and this resolution would uh, have the Harbor District uh, concur with the CEQA findings uh, and staff recommends um, adopting the resolution, approving the permit. I have a motion. So move. Second. All and, right. you know, it's, it's just good to have our infrastructure for recreation well maintained. So kudos to the city of Eureka for stepping up and uh, catalyzing this investment. And uh, it kind of ties into the whole uh, area there. So it's a real amenity. More good stuff. Marks, anything? No. All right. Uh, anyone from the public? Any hands? Okay. Second director author, do we have a roll call? Yes, Commissioner Marks. Yes. Commissioner Higgins. Yes. And Vice President Newman. Yes. Moving on to item D. Notification for the removal and relocation of military vessel 1091 temporarily stored on district property APN 4010310040. Yeah, so the uh, district has been preparing for some upcoming developments along the uh, Samoa Peninsula, and we've worked with the 1091 organization and uh, their. Uh, appointed leadership to consider the relocation of the vessel. The vessel was originally brought to district property when it was directed to be removed from Humboldt Bay. It was uh, given a, uh, a permit waiver uh, so it could be stored temporarily. That time has expired, but through cooperative efforts, everybody's worked diligently to try to find um, a new life or a new location for the uh, vessel 1091. So what's uh, out here now is that we uh, have prepared a memo in draft form that would put notice out to the membership of the 1091 to uh, number one, understand that it must be relocated, that we're out of compliance with uh, the original agreement, and that uh, the district may consider it going to other district owned land, provided the appropriate um, discretionary permits could be obtained. And then of course the relocation could occur along with whatever other credentials would be necessary for it to operate there on a more permanent basis. There's a timeline in here that is quite specific, and it's understood that while we're doing this in a cooperative effort, that if one of the milestones are missed, then that would accelerate notice for the vessel to uh, be removed or, if unfortunate, uh, demolished. Uh, we are considering other options with the 1091 if uh, something like that had to be considered that we would try our best um, to help them find placement for portions of the vessel if, if that was the outcome. So uh, that's where we're at at this point in time. So we're asking uh, for the memo to be reviewed and for direction to be given that we can go ahead and proceed forward. Um, the memo was shared in the packet. And so the uh, participants or the um, designees rather from the 1091 organization um, have reviewed that and been notified. So thank you. I'd like to move uh, to adopt this action. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any commenters? Public, any hands? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any further comments? Oh, I've been impressed by the dedication of the people that are so committed to the vessel. So I hope that we're able to achieve an outcome uh, that they desire. And so I'm glad that we're kind of setting boundaries though, because we have obligations as a district in terms of meeting agreements for and permits for its placement. So I think this is a logical action and I'm glad that we're fully engaged with uh, the 1091 um advocates so that we help work 
with them and empower them if that if they so choose. Thank you. Well said. I totally agree with those comments and uh, glad to see this move in the right direction. A roll call on that, Rick Rucker. Commissioner Higgins. Yes. Commissioner Marks. Yes. And Vice President Newman. Yes. All right, item E, consider appointing bar pilot apprentice interviewed by the pilotage advisory subcommittee, Andrew Manning. Yes, the state of California is delegated to the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, the responsibility of overseeing bar pilots in Humboldt Bay. Um, ordinance 16 of the district um, outlines our regulations, which includes uh, the oversight of a training program for uh, candidates and apprentices of pilots. We have a subcommittee, um, the uh, pilot advisory subcommittee, which met uh, last week or the week before and interviewed a candidate, Andrew Manning. Uh, and the committee is recommending that the board approve him for an apprenticeship uh, position. All right. Do I have the make a motion? I'll uh, second. And I'd like to hear from Commissioner Newman since you know quite a bit about it. Well, uh, you'll hear from me after we go to the public. <laughs> I see Andrew is actually here. If he'd like to say anything, we'd love to hear from him. Otherwise, anyone that would like to make public comment on this, please raise your hand. I just wanted to say uh, thank you, everybody. I've, I've been paying attention the whole time, so uh, patiently waiting for this moment. But uh, thank you for the time in the spotlight, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, hopefully become a, a bar pilot here in this port and contribute back to the community here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for uh, hanging around with us tonight. Anyone else? Not seeing anyone else. Uh, bring it back to the board. Well, I just, you know, it's, it's great to uh, cultivate somebody to fill this position that's both vital to our enterprise and also a pretty good way to make a living. And so I think this is a step in the right direction. I appreciate the Harvard District's efforts in this regard and to the folks who serve on the committee uh, and to Andrew himself. And I look forward to us kind of uh, having, building the staffing necessary for pilotage as we grow the port's business back out. Mark Andrew, we really appreciate that you're uh, being considered to, to want to do this. And so your uh, resume is very impressive, and uh, I'm hoping for the best for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I heard nothing but good things uh, about uh, you, Andrew, and um, uh, the commitment you're taking on is, is a big one, having to get several rides on boats as basically a volunteer in order to become a pilot. And more pilots is something that's going to be essential to this port going forward. Uh, we've got a lot of business coming our way if things come together like it appears to be, so. Oh, um, I guess for due diligence, it's our cost factor associated with this apprenticeship. Uh, no, there, there is not, but what we want to do is that we, uh, within the draft fee resolution is to establish basically an apprentice, um, uh, a surcharge to place on, on ships. That's something that we're currently looking on that we wanna bring back to the, the board uh, so that we can try to do some sort of a uh, compensation uh, to these uh, trainees as they're going through the program. Great. I favor that. All right. So we can do a roll call vote on this. Commissioner Higgins? Yeah. Commissioner Marks? Yes. And Vice President Newman? Yes. That's a bunch of good news. Can we keep going? Yeah. <laughs> do we have any future agenda items? <laughs> no, but I'll make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Good job.